Hey Threads fans, we know you love sewing just like we love sewing, and we know you'll love joining us in person at an original sewing and quilt expo near you. There's shopping, garment exhibits, demonstrations, and hands-on classes taught by experts who can help elevate your sewing skills. Plus, check out the exclusive Threads Magazine fashion exhibit. It's all live and in person at Original Sewing and Quilt Expo. See what cities we're coming to next. Visit SewingExpo.com. Hello and welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast with the editors of Threads Magazine. I'm your host, Carol Frazier, and today I'm joined by our longtime contributing editors, Kenneth King and Susan Calgy. Okay, uh, let me give you a little up, a little uh, intro to Susan and Kenneth. Both are experts in couture design, widely read authors, and sought-after educators. They're also recipients of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association of Sewing and Design Professionals. Susan runs a sewing school and leads couture arts tours to London and Paris. She also hosts an online couture sewing forum to bring enthusiasts from around the world together for inspiration, camaraderie, and education. Kenneth is an instructor at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York and teaches private students at his Manhattan studio. As a designer, he has seen his custom pieces worn by celebrities and preserved in major museum collections, including the Victoria and Albert in London and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Susan and Kenneth have deep experience in the world of couture fashion, so they know what goes into making and wearing a custom garment of the highest quality. Today, we'll talk about the ethics of wearing vintage couture and the practical aspects of owning couture garments, whether you buy them, inherit them, or dive into creating them yourself. Welcome, Susan and Kenneth. Thank you. Thanks. Happy to be here. It's so nice to have you both. Um, This topic of discussion uh, came about because (laughs) Kenneth had an example that he mentioned a a couple of weeks ago that we kind of chatted about, and I was wondering, Kenneth, would you give us uh, the background of that? (laughs) Well, this is something that's been in the news a lot, and it is Kim Kardashian wearing Marilyn Monroe's Mm. gown to the Met Gala. Now, I, 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 I just, it just sends me up the wall to see something like this because she has, she was not, she had no figure for this. She, they, they basically, they ruined the dress shoving her into it for her three minutes of um, fame. And what I find so painful about this was this is a dress that was worn. It was part of history. It was made of an extremely fragile fabric called souffle, which isn't made anymore. And souffle was a fabric that was dyed to match the person's skin. And so it gave the illusion of bare skin. And so the garment was extremely fragile when it was new. And so after 60 years, and and I saw the videos online where they were just forcing this dress up over her hips. And I just, I just wanted to say, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. There are certain things that I think should be left to history and not destroyed. And so today I was looking online and there are more photos surfacing of the damage done to this dress. And it just, it, it saddens me quite frankly. So how do you feel about um, wearing of any kind of vintage garment? Do you think it has to do with the cultural significance or, or other? Well, I think part of it is, is the garment sort of a garden variety kind of, there, you know, like, for example, Yves Saint Laurent suits. There are hundreds of them around. Wearing a vintage Yves Saint Laurent suit, first off, they're more robust. They can kind of stand up to wear. Secondly, there are so many of them. But for something where there's there's just one, like this dress, um, to me, it just it's a shame because mm-hmm. there will never be another dress like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's really ruined. You know, it's funny because. You know, we were talking about the whole idea of these these vintage clothes and what are these collections for now. Now, the dress that Kardashian wore was at the Ripley's, believe it or not, museum. Perhaps not surprisingly. Um, it did not end up at one of the big collections. But those, to me, have a role that's educational as much as, as anything. 
where you really go and see the workmanship, the art that went into these things. And that that was a very special part of that dress because Kenneth mentions it was very specific fabric, beautifully made for that person on that specific date. Again, I don't have a problem with, you know, with most of the usage of this. It's really pretty sturdy stuff, as Kenneth says. But it's funny, I made an analogy. So you can see behind me there's an e-catch from the 1800s, very precious. And I thought, oh, my goodness, if somebody used that as a tablecloth, I would be hysterical. Um, So, And I was equally disturbed by the Kardashian use. But, yeah, I think it speaks to a very special place in history which is what that dress had, which is what some of these dresses have, these, these beautiful examples. So now back to what Susan talked about, educational. One of the things I tell my students at FIT is you learn about clothing by looking at clothing, mm. not pictures of clothing on the Internet. And so, you know, some people think, well, why do we have museums for these things? Why can't people just wear them? And yes, again, there are some garments that are fairly commonplace and you can, you can wear them. Kenneth, where do you send your students to look at clothing? Well, we have a we have a study collection at FIT, which I think is really quite wonderful. I also in my mm-hmm. office, I and I tell my students this, I have clothing that is part of my library. So if I need to illustrate a point or like to say show a particular detail in context, I have a whole I have about 20 feet of hang space, actually, of garments that I've collected over the years that I bring in. And between the study collection at FIT and the things I have that I bring in and the things that I actually make and bring in, I can give my students the clothing. And I tell them every single time you pick up a garment, you look at it, you mine it for information. How deep is that hem? How are the seams finished? Is it a lining? Is it a, you know, how did they handle the construction on this? Because that's the only way you truly learn about it. So, you know, that's, um, that's, and I think this, it kind of relates back to this particular dress because there will never be another one. And now the one that we had is tattered and damaged. It's a shame. Mm Mm-hmm. I always say, I wish clothes could talk, but they do. They do. They speak volumes to us. Well, so if you have a precious garment that you own, that you was handed down in your family or you purchased it somewhere, how would you recommend taking care of it? Carefully, sorry, carefully stored. Pardon me, carefully stored in a box, acid-free paper out of sunlight, not hanging. Yeah, recently, well, a little while ago, I had a um, a woman want me to make, as she put it on the phone, I have my mother's wedding veil, I want to have it remade. And I thought, great, what's this going to be? <laughs> and it turned out, it was it was one of those times where in my humble studio, I didn't get, I've never seen anything like this. It was, grandma bought it in Belgium in the 1880s. And its original life, it was a trumpet flare skirt, six inches across diameter of Belgian lace, handmade Belgian lace. And so when I saw this, I mean, she had it just thrown in this old blanket box. I said, okay, first off, we got we to gotta look at the uh, storage issues on this. And so she wanted a wedding veil. So what I did is I made a headpiece and then I made a separate thing that this lace attached to. And so there was a tool that hit the floor. So this didn't actually have to sit on the floor. And then this whole thing detached so that it could be put to safety. So she wouldn't have to drag it around at the reception. And I said to her, I will not cut into this. Hmm. I will not do anything that can't be undone. And so, um, that is how I would handle something like that. You know, if you have something that you, can safely wear, say if it's a, a beefy coat, don't do anything that can't be reversed. But if it is kind of tenuous or fragile, then, you know, you get the acid-free boxes, you get the mm-hmm. acid-free tissue paper, and you show it the respect it deserves. Did you have to clean that lace in any way first? No, no, uh, because really, uh, I was talking with the uh, the curator at the De Young Museum in San Francisco, and she's at the time when I told her what I was working on, she looked at me and she said, and this was, we're talking like 87, 88. It was a while ago. She said, that is about $80,000 worth of lace right there. 
Good I mean, Lord. she knew exactly what it was, and I knew what it was, and it scared me to know. It was like, don't do anything. Could you, could you even stitch into it? No. Well, I I tacked it to the mm. the headpiece. Right. But you know, it was you know, it was it didn't feel fragile. That was the mm-hmm. thing. It was mm-hmm. just that I understood that this was something that was so far beyond what I was insured to absorb mm-hmm. that nothing could happen to it. So, and so. I made the headpiece, then I made made the, the the veil with the little thing. They had two separate boxes, and I did the whole thing mm-hmm. about, okay, when you put this away, every year you change the acid-free tissue paper. You keep this thing, you know, out of the light, out of the heat. Don't put it in your attic, because she had it in an old Bullock's blanket box in her attic. I'm like, that that's gotta stop. <laughs> But it was it was it was one of the truly spectacular fabrics that I got to work with in my day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Susan, how about you? Do you have you ever remade a, an old wedding I gown? I have. I was thinking about it. I said, Gosh, it was years and years ago. And you know, you would love to look at it the, with the eyes and experience you have now, as opposed to the eyes and experience you had then. But it was a long time ago, and they brought a dress. It was incredibly old, and it had been worn by many, many, many brides. And I remember it was so fragile, you couldn't even touch it with an iron. You know, the the fibers would just sort of slake off if you did that. So I did minimal, minimal treatment. I did a lot of shoring things up with tulle on the inside. You know, somebody wanted to wear it. And I think there's something special about that. I, I respect these things tremendously, but I also realize that there is a point at which they're done no matter what you do with them. So to me, it was wonderful that somebody wanted to wear it. And I thought that was better. I I might have hastened its demise a little bit, but I certainly tried to be careful. But rather than locking it away forever and it being so precious you don't even touch it, I don't know what the point of that is. So I, I was as careful as I possibly could be. And I do think it did get one more wear out of it. I know they they wanted this to be worn into perpetuity, not going to happen. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, let's let's get through this wedding, which I know she did. Um, that, I think, was, was the most fragile thing that I've dealt with. I've certainly been given old lace to incorporate into, into beautiful sleeves, you know, sort of picture those beautiful tiered sleeves. Um, and as Kenneth kind of said, those laces can be pretty sturdy. They really can, even the really old ones. If you treat them gently, it's fine. But I don't, it's, it's a tough call. It's a very tough call about what you should use, what you should respect. It's all going to fall apart eventually, and that's the heartbreak. I mean, I, my ECAT behind me, I see little splits in the silk, and breaks my heart. Should it be packed away where no one can see it? Well, what's the point of that? At least I'm enjoying it and loving it and appreciating the artistry that went into it. Um, it's it's a gray area. It's difficult. Um, I was I was horrified by the Kim Kardashian thing too. And I thought, oh, th- this is perfect. You know what? When this idea occurred to her, she must have thought, oh, this is just perfect. I'll wear Marilyn's dress. You know what? What better? Kind of the perfect storm of, of this celebrity universe. But sadly, the dress really did suffer. And as Kenneth mentioned, photographs have come up later that show even further destruction of an incredibly fragile fabric. To begin with, it does either one of you know if it's possible to or desirable to, in some way, um, re- uh, uh, fix that gown, or is it no, a matter so. of just? It's gone. I, I think you're done. No, you're no, done. The fabric is torn. It's like taking a piece mm-hmm. of silk chiffon and tearing it. I, you know, it's done. Mm-hmm. You're done. I know it's a shame. Now you mentioned Susan. You mentioned working with lace. Now we did an article. Um, we had a designer named Mimi Prober. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Mm -hmm. she, what she did, and it is one of the more beautiful threads covers we had with the two lace dresses on the cover. And what she does is she has collected fragments of laces dating back to the 1700s. I don't know where she gets her hands on these things, but... You do. And, but yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> you do. And, and what was, what's been so wonderful about that, so this is kind of a, a little flip side about what do you do with these things. Mm-hmm. What she has done is she has created these dresses where she's collaged together all of these bits of lace. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can start out with a pile of really expensive materials and make a mess of it. But she has a particular thing. 
And these dresses, I remember the first time I saw the ivory one, I, I wept. It was mm-hmm. that astonishing. Mm-hmm. And so I think taking, you know, taking maybe fragments of something mm-hmm. that are still viable mm-hmm. and then turning it, she wasn't trying to recreate a period garment. She was creating something for the 21st century. And she's be, she's being quite successful. I'm very mm-hmm. thrilled about that. So mm-hmm. she's taking heritage from the past and using it for the future. So that is something I endorse. I think that is a really good way of using a lot of these fragments that otherwise would sit in a box somewhere. No, it's brilliant and it makes perfect sense. And it's something you can do with lace. Can you take an old fabric from the same period and reuse it? Probably not. It wouldn't have much charm, but lace has that unique and exquisite appeal. Now, is it because of the fiber the lace is made of or the lace construction that keeps it uh, lasting longer than just a, a woven fabric? You know, I think it's probably the fiber because my understanding is a lot of the laces are cotton. Or linen. Or linen, yeah. Mm-hmm. So th- th- it's a fairly robust fabric. Mm-hmm. You know, they they rely upon, now this sounds like in the weeds, they rely upon the proper moisture content at a molecular level to stay strong. Mm -hmm. So if they're stored, you know, if they're not set in a box in an attic in Texas in the desert, they're going to hang, they're going to hang around. And lace Mm -hmm. was always regarded throughout history really as an asset. It was something that Mm -hmm. you passed on. It was, you know, you, you bought it, it was like jewelry. And I think Mm -hmm. part of that was because it was durable. So that's why a lot of it has come down to us. And it was an adornment, you know, it was sort of an add on in a lot of cases. So it could be separated off the garment and put away and repurposed. Well, I think this sounds like good advice for listeners who may have (laughs) these kinds of assets in their their stash somewhere and want to do something with them. So it's it's good advice. I think another thing is that lace, usually it is dyed. You know, it's the natural thread. And sometimes I've seen a lot of black lace and that seems to disintegrate a little more quickly. So I, I, maybe the oxides in it or some from the dye, but the fact that it hasn't been dyed, maybe that expands its life cycle a little bit. Just a thought. Well, so we've been talking about the, the fashion don't of wearing the vintage garment. So I would love to know what the two of you think is a great fashion do who what celebrities really do a great job of walking the red carpet Tilda Swinton I think we <laughs> love um kind of a, a always original um, Kate mm-hmm. Blanchett can look can look quite stunning what I are think. the what are the designers that they wear that you particularly like not even sure these days. Kenneth, do you know? You know, I, I'm going to just take a little side road here about the uh, the fashion parade at the Met Gala this oh. time. And honestly, I was talking to my husband and I said, it looked like a clown car. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you have this, she shows up in a dress and then it transforms. She has four different people to unfurl <laughs> things. And then it's a completely different dress. And I just thought, okay, just because, again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Mm-hmm. Um so it's, I'm not really enamored of the red carpet these days. I have people ask me, do you, you know, you should be on the red carpet. Well, yeah, I was in the past when they actually bought their garments. But one of the things that people don't really talk about is most of those things that go down those red carpets, they're not paying for. Someone mm-hmm. has paid for that for them, um, which then it turns into instead of the person actually showing their personality. Because years ago, when I first started my career, I was advised by a very smart man. He said, do not go down the wearable art road. I hope I don't step on any toes here. But, you know, there's a difference. He said, wearable art, the garment is the star. Couture, the person wearing the garment Mm -hmm. is the star. Absolutely. And so Mm -hmm. recently I did this mother of the groom dress for, um, this lady. And she just wanted to look lovely. Mm -hmm. And she understood with her particular figure, she didn't have a bad figure, but she was a little bit asymmetrical and she understood she couldn't get it off the rack. She had a very specific vision of what she wanted. And I was able to create that for her. And there's a photo on my Instagram of her walking with her husband. And you can see the look on her face as she knew she looked good. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about. And I look at these people carrying these clothes and I just think, 
you know, it's, you're kind of secondary. The clothing is, Mm -hmm. is the first thing. And so they have tipped over into the wearable art category. And I guess that's why I, I tend not to be too, um, enamored of the red carpets. The other thing is you can always tell in a strapless garment if it has been made for the person wearing it, because there are two things you can look for. One is their elbows are clenched tightly to their rib cage, so they don't lose it. <laughs> Holding it up. Seriously. And then they're kind of hunched over slightly so they don't spill out over the top. Now, my friends will not ask me to come watch like any of these red carpet things because they know I'm going to be like going, that was not made for her. That was not made for her. Look. So, you know, is, maybe I'm kind of taking a, you know, a little side road on that. But, um, you know, that said, Judy Dench, I love Judy Dench. She's wonderful. But I think it's an important side road. And I think people have to be careful not into, to fall into that trap of what has become a celebrity driven society and the fashion shows. Now the people in the front row of the fashion shows are the, the same people who turn up at the Met Gala. And it's about publicity, not about fashion. And Kenneth's absolutely right. You know, when I make a a garment for someone. I, I said once to a bride, I said, because I, I did custom bridal for years, and I said, you know, the dress is only the means to the end. And she didn't get it. She did. I thought, Ooh, forget that. Because to her, it was all about the dress. It was entirely a thousand percent about the dress. In fact, I think that was the girl who asked for, she wanted the longest train I'd ever made. How was the long, long was the longest train? She wanted hers longer. Okay. This to her was totally and, about and- the dress. But, but as Kenneth said, it's the means to the end. It's how you feel in it. You know, it's, and then I think, you, you know, you're dressed beautifully. You feel wonderful. That's your armor. And then you go on to have a wonderful day, a wonderful time, a wonderful play, a wonderful interaction. Because the, that garment has given you the confidence. But it's not about the garment. It's how the garment makes you feel. And I would always look. I look at students, too. How do they, how do they, how do they stand in a dress? Are they breathing? Are they talking? freely or like Kenneth says are they standing there with their elbows crammed up against their rib cage you know what is their what is their mean what is their their stance their conversation their breathing pattern and then if all of that is as it should be then you know you you've done your job like that the the woman in her pretty blue dress looked so happy and the dress served its purpose mm-hmm. but it's not at all what's happened at some of these publicity driven events now i want to know what was the longest train you ever made Oh, God, it was huge. I, I, I don't even, it was in the next room. <laughs> 25 feet or so, I don't know. Wow. It, was, it was huge. Mm. And this will make you laugh, just a little side thing. Back in the day, I used to go to these weddings. I'm not sure why, but she and her husband's poor fellow, just sort of following her around, came out of the church. They had a staged entry into the limousine, the Rolls Royce with pigeons that flew off. Well, mm. the pigeons didn't behave. <laughs> so they had to film this again. So it just tells you something about that hole. She'd have been fine in the front row at the Met. Really, she'd have fit right in. Well, so it sounds like if you're if you're working with an, a, a private student, it, there's there's the opportunity to guide that person through the design process to find something that really represents what they want to feel like and look like on their special day or whatever day they plan to wear the garment. Mm-hmm. I, I would ask you, Kenneth, how do you do that with a classroom of students who perhaps intend to go into ready-to-wear design? Is there, well, you know, I see the the FIT thing has kind of there was like before teaching pattern teaching pattern making past teaching pattern making. They decided to put all their pattern making in one semester, so I, I don't teach that anymore. So I I primarily teach technique now. So I don't have as much input into like, okay, you know, what are you trying to achieve here in the design? Although I do have students seek me out to just kind of say, can you give me some help on this? Um, What I tell them, you know, when I'm teaching them, I tell them I'm giving you a bag of tricks. This is your bag of tools. You know, Mm -hmm. this is how you do this, how you do this. And it's repeatable and reliable. And Mm -hmm. there are other ways of doing it, but... This is going to get you there reliably. Um, But as far as designing, I I say to them, you know, keep all of these things in your head. And this is 
also why I bring garments in every week. Like, for example, if I'm doing double welt pockets, I'll bring in several garments that have double welt pockets or bound buttonholes or Mm -hmm. whatever, because then they can see, okay, here, you know, it's not just an isolated swatch that they're making. They're going to see that, okay, in this particular jacket, they use the welt pockets this way, or they could use them this way. And it's uh, so... But for my, and when they ask me about my particular process, it's really about technique drives aesthetic. And if you know more techniques, Mm -hmm. you can make more interesting designs. If you just know, you know, a straight sleeve and a straight jacket, that's all you get. Well, you, you widen their vocabulary. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I find that very interesting. I, uh, I am thinking about this idea of the the Met Gala becoming a clown show, essentially a clown car with people just getting out. I can't remember when that started to happen. It it wasn't always like that. The Academy Awards used to be elegant and then suddenly it all went. It was when people stopped paying for their own clothes. Mm -hmm. See, in in my first, yeah, I had things in commercials and music videos and on the red carpets and all of this when people were buying Mm -hmm. And then it was in the early to mid 90s. And I think it was Armani and Versace really started it where they started just throwing trunk loads of clothes at people. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to a stylist and she said that, like, for example, actress A would get, you know, she would bring in like a rack of things. Mm -hmm. And with the with the, you know, the little carrot to the person like, oh, let us borrow it. You're going to be on the Academy Awards. Mm -hmm. And. You know, if there were 20 garments, you had a one in 20 chance of getting. And, right. and, they, and then the other thing is a lot of times they never gave them back. Mm-hmm. So I think that's when that's when it tilted from people using clothing as an expression of their particular personality to companies using it as a branding opportunity. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's a whole societal thing, isn't it? You know, if. The media and Instagram, and I'm it, I'm sure sociologists are studying this to see when there was this when there was this big shift away from the true art of it to the publicity of it. Right. Well, if you were invited to something other than the Met Gala, but something big, <laughs> what, do, do you have a do you have a plan? <laughs> you go first, Susan. Oh gosh, wait a minute, my. Okay, sorry, lost the, lost the vision for one second. Yes, I do have a plan. Um, <laughs> we'll try to fact. get you an invitation. <laughs> Actually, somebody did ask a while ago. They, I was invited to a luncheon at the Metropolitan Opera, and honestly, like anybody, the first thing that went through my head was, oh, my Lord, what would I wear? Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I was out of town and I couldn't make it, but the person said, oh, don't worry, they'll be next year. So COVID has happened, so maybe this invitation will come again, but... Uh, we all saw, and it was the lovely Federico 4K book mm. that came out a while back. Amazing man who's still alive. Talk about a Renaissance man. And there was a beautiful, if you can see this dress mm. in it, just gorgeous. And check out that trim around the top. So then I happened to find the vintage pattern of it. And you can see that pretty V down the back. So there's that piece in the puzzle. Then I found (laughs) the fabric, putting all the pieces together. Um, I had a friend with a wonderful fabric store in Melbourne, and she was going out of business. And I thought, well, I'll just help her out a little bit. And I got this beautiful cloquet. And it's interesting, cloquet in French means blistered. And you can see, indeed, it's Mm -hmm. very blistered. But then there was the question of that trim around the neck, which I think is what made that dress so spectacular. So did all kinds of searching. I looked in New York. I looked in Paris. Couldn't find anything. So the other day I thought, hmm, rhinestone necklace. So I actually Googled rhinestone necklaces, and one of the department stores had rhinestone necklaces. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're easy to take apart. In fact, it sort of fell apart as I was unpacking it. But I ordered four of these, (laughs) and um, they come apart really pretty easily, the different bits. So I will end up with lots of these separate things. And I, I think somehow those will go around the neck and down the V's in the back. So that that's my evil plan. And you know, 
we, we talk a lot, you know, I'm sure Kenneth has the same thing with students who say, oh, I don't go anywhere. Oh, I never need a dress like that. I don't have that kind of life. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You can have a dinner party with your friends. You could go out to dinner. I'm often the most elaborately dressed person at an event, and I don't care. That's fine with me. So kind of like if you build it, they'll come. If you, if you have it, you'll find a place to wear it. So um, I'm still waiting for that invitation to the med luncheon. <laughs> this might be a little overdone <laughs> for that, but... Well, we'll see. But that's that's my plan. Kenneth, what would you wear? Well, I like the frock coats that I make. Oh, yes. Yes. And they're the, the one that I made... It was, I want to say 2020. I, I lose track with the COVID. I feel like time has lost all meaning. Totally. I just had, I saw, and it was like right here in my mind. I could see it, but I couldn't see it. But it was, it's a combination of reverse applique, applique, trapunto, and it's a black boiled wool. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it was, it was a case of, I had to just go on this search and just burn through a bunch of fabric. And I, I actually made a video of the whole process to show my students because my students think, oh, you get the idea and ding, there it is. And I'm like, no, it's a process. That's why they call it the creative process. And it's, you know, it, I just wanted like little bits of deep blood red to show behind some of the fabric. And it has blood red top stitching and the blood red buttonholes. And, you know, I made it because I had to. Mm-hmm. I just had to. It was just, it was, I could see it. It kept hanging there. And I thought, I just have to sit down and do it. And so I actually finally got to wear it to a birthday party in February. But if, <gasps> if oh, I were did. asked to the Met, I, it's like, I know I would wear it with different <laughs> pants because I wore it with jeans for that because it was a, like a party in Brooklyn. But I know exactly what I would wear. And it would not, it would not look like a regular black tie. It would be one of the one of the frock coats because I do have a fondness for that particular shape because for my particular physiognomy at this particular (laughs) advanced stage of my life, it's very flattering. Well, if I get invited to that Met luncheon again, you'll, you'll be my plus one. Okay. I'll go. (laughs) I think that sounds like a, uh, definitely a moment for the paparazzi. (laughs) <laughs> show up well, kind of, in our own minds yes. but to add to add to what susan said and what i talked about earlier i really i really believe that if you have a few of those garments in your wardrobe mm-hmm. you're more likely to accept an invitation i know people who turn down invitations because they said well i didn't have anything to wear like mm-hmm. really really yep. why i have a student who said every time i need something special i go to one of the couture garments that i made in class with you that's that's my armor. That's that's where I go. I know I'll look great. Um, it'll fit. It'll flatter. I'll feel wonderful. That's what I go to. And it's wonderful to have those things in your closet. Well, you know, you, you don't. You also use the word armor. And this is something mm-hmm. I, I've had this because at, at FIT, one of the things I try to do with my students is like talk about life because I don't think, you know, I, I think they need to learn how to navigate as well as so. And one of the one day I was I was wearing in a chain mail vest over my T-shirt because I had to go in after the class and have a very unpleasant conversation with someone. And so the students were asking me about it. I said, this is what I call fashion is armor. Mm -hmm. And I had my steel-toed boots on. Mm -hmm. I had my, like, Ray Ban glasses, and you know, I I have you know I have outfits for different kinds of situations where I need the outfit mm-hmm. to be part of how I buck myself up and mm-hmm. get myself into a certain thing. So yeah, I think fashion. You know, a lot of people think fashion is very superficial, but it's something we live in every day, whether we live in sweats and t-shirts or evening clothes. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's superficial at all. I think it's one of the most important things we can do for ourselves. And I rail against the fact that people think it's, it's unimportant. It just doesn't matter. Oh, it's just clothes. I completely disagree with that. I think it's a huge part of who we are. And like Kenneth says, what do you wear when you need a little bit more iron in your backbone? What do you need for that important occasion? Do you generally find that your students... Um, are are in tune with what will help them get that sense of protection or self-confidence from their clothing? Do they need guidance with that? 
I think Kenneth deals obviously with a younger demographic than I do. Um, although, you know, so, so many of my students are older and then you do get into those body issues where you know that people maybe don't have the figure they had and we're so, we're so hard on ourselves about that. And, you know, I joke and I, I say anyone can wear anything. Well, that's a ridiculous generalization. But if it fits and flatters and really does make you make your best, yeah, kind of anyone can, in a way, wear anything. And I think that's part of my job, to make them look the very best they can, you know, given, given the parameters we're working in within. Yeah, and I think, I think the right fabric, the right fit, the right proportions – um, of course, put together with the right engineering construction. But those things really do go a tremendously long way to, to helping, helping give you that confidence, you know, that, that, I don't know, it's almost lighter in spirit when it all comes together. It really is. There's a tremendous power in this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, I know and the Kenneth fact would agree. Oh, yeah, and I think the fact that you've made it yourself. If you are one of your students and you, mm. the, the two of you lead people through this process of making something where they they can actually also feel good because they constructed that. that well, yeah, I mean, there's that whole other wonderful level of that sort of self-satisfaction, that sort of accomplishment of, mm-hmm. of bringing someone along to that point. Yeah, and that's when it, that's when it all yeah. kind of, you know, coalesces and sort of all clicks together, and you get something very magical, I think. Well, you know, one good example was the Watteau back uh, oh. coat. Oh, wow. Yes. This, <laughs> this was so much fun. Oh, my God. She had this idea. And, and yeah. she had the photos. And, you know, this is one mm-hmm. of those, because see, Susan's a trained draper. I'm a trained pattern maker. So we kind of come at the problem from a different viewpoint. Yeah. And so she just, she looked at me and she said, I think this is a job for flat pattern. And mm-hmm. so, you know, there were, we had to do a lot of research because there were photos that she brought online. And there was one bit of information I was looking for. So I said, I need to see her with her arm up. And she got a photo and I was able to see, okay, that's what I need to know. Cause, and then, so then it was a whole flat pattern thing. And, you know, it was fun because I generate, see, I work in half scale a lot of the time. It's a lot more efficient. You can, Mm -hmm. um, you don't waste a lot of fabric. You don't waste a lot of paper. You can kind of test run it to see, okay, is this going to fit together? And then if it does, you take it over to Kinko's, you Xerox it at 200% and, Yay, you're good to go. And so that is what, you know, that was my part of it was she had this vision of this coat and then she bought this amazing fabric. And then, then it was like, okay, now here, Susan will. (laughs) Over to you, Calgy. It it was amazing. So just to back up a tiny bit, wonderful girl came to us sit and so, and she had had this picture. She studies with me a lot and I'd seen this picture before and I maybe in time could have kind of cooked it up, but I thought, no, 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 no. This, this is a job for Mr. King. And I said, look, come to the sit and sew. So she showed Kenneth this picture, and honestly, I could see immediately the cogs. <coughs> Pardon me. The wheels started turning in Kenneth's head. You can almost see the steam coming out of his ears because this was <laughs> just the sort of challenge he loves. Oh, yes. He started folding paper. There was a tracing wheel involved to, you know, to duplicate this thing. It was amazing. So, so they got a workable, workable muslin. And then we had to find the right fabric. Um, and bless her heart, she certainly put her money where her mouth was. And we did a lot of private sessions because this dress was of such a scope. In the first place, we had seven and a half yards of fabric. Um, it was too big of a scope to do in a regular couture class. You just couldn't. It, it was it, this. You know, it's interesting. Most of the projects my students do are couture projects. Every now and then I get an haute couture project. And that's what this was, which was what made it so much fun. So we found the fabric. It was spread out over I don't know how many tables it took in the studio to put the whole thing up because it had a repeat. Every four patterns, it was different. And um, it was a combination of private lessons and class lessons. But it all culminated, the whole point of it all, she wanted to come to Paris for her 50th birthday. And I, I was the one who said, well, gosh, you could wear this. We always go to the ballet. So you could wear this to the gorgeous Opera Garnier building with this huge marble staircase. And I promised. I said, if you, if you wear this in Paris, I will find 
I know, a handsome Frenchman who will walk you up those steps. So that kind of became the goal of this whole thing. Oh, and this is a funny story. So, of course, things were postponed because of the pandemic. The trip got, you know, pushed off and off and off again. And gosh, she was probably 52 by the time it finally happened, not 50. But at one point we were scheduled to go. So here I am looking at the schedule of the Opry Garnier. And the week we were supposed to go, it was shut this is post-pandemic. There was nothing there. And I thought, oh, my God, I've sold this dress, this creation, Kenneth, me, Paris, because of this moment. And there's nothing. So I started looking around. I thought, oh, my God, is anything going on in, in Lyon in, and Versailles? I looked everywhere. There was nothing going on. So fortunately, that date was shifted again. And indeed, the week we went, there was something. So she did have her Oh, it was it was a triumph for her. It it was it was an incredible moment, and um, I think life changing. It was quite you know this journey that she went on from seeing a, a dress that she absolutely loved, and then I have to say to her credit, she brought in the people who could who who could help her achieve this vision. So um, kind of a remarkable journey for for all of us, and certainly for her, it looked fabulous. Well, so for listeners, this is a teaser for an article that will be coming up in a future issue of Threads. You will the, read the, more about this. Uh, well, and, and I should uh, say, she's writing the article, which is so thrilling and appropriate, you know, coming from her, mm-hmm. her perspective of how can I make a dream come true? Pretty, yeah. pretty good. And, and, and that, was, that was going to be, you know, one of the points I was hoping that you would make today, that if, if you are interested in wearing that really, really special garment, you don't have to mine the racks of old <laughs> things or try to buy something new, you can actually f- find the exact thing that works for you and you can make it yourself. Yeah. So, so now well, you, t- you were talking about documentation and storage. Mm. That's right. Yes. Do you want to well, tell us a little bit about that? I want to talk a little bit about that because I, I sent some photos. There is, um, a, sadly, a dear friend of mine passed in November and he had one of my dinner jackets. And the L.A. County Museum of Art has, they have the largest number of pieces of my work. And when I first, got, when I first really kind of realized that, oh, museums might want my work, it was back in 1990 when I had met Edward Mater, who was then the curator of costume at the L.A. County Museum of Art. And one of the things he said to me was, document. You have to document everything. You have to make it easier for the historians to figure out what you did and when you did it. So... What I started doing then, and I still do it, is I have a serial number on each piece. So, for example, I had a a, a guy contact me, oh, it was a couple months ago, and his mother had bought some work for me in the 90s. And actually, one of the jackets is in my book, Cool Couture. So, you know, he was saying, do you want them back? And I said, well, you know, I kind of like them back, but, you know, she can actually, she's donated before. She could donate again. And so... Give me the number on the piece. So he gave me the number on on the label. And so I was able to go back to my archive. I could tell what when it was made, what number what what number it was in the serial number of piece, you know, for that year, who bought it, when she bought it, how much mm-hmm. she paid for it. You know, I was able to give a whole document on this is the history of the piece and this is how it came to her. And these are the publications it was published in. So Mm -hmm. this dinner jacket that my friend Stuart had, um, since I'm the executor, I made the decision that, you know, it's going to be offered to the L.A. County Museum, you know, in memory of him from his estate, which is true. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I have to get together now before I uh, submit it is, you know, I have the label on the inside. This particular one was a sample. This was like a Mm -hmm. prototype. This is not an actual piece for sale. And so that's how he got it is, you know, so it's, you know, some people think it's a little bit, well, are you fancy that you're going to do this? But why not? You know, Edward Mater said people are going to want to know. And somewhere, somewhere down the road, Mm -hmm. someone's going to get interested and Mm -hmm. um, ask who is this person? And so there is an archive. So there's, you know, I, you can kind of place everything. I have 
photographs of most, not every, all of everything. Because I explained to my students that way back in the day, you know, when I started, I had a rotary phone and a typewriter. And I had a camera <laughs> that had film. And there were times that, you know, in the early days when I was melting down my jewelry to make orders, that I didn't have any money for a film, you know, because you had to shoot it and then you had to get it developed. You yeah. know, the idea that you can just like pull your camera out and take as many photos as you want and it doesn't cost you anything, you know, it's a little different. But, you know, as much as possible, I've documented what I have, even, you know, and pat like with patterns, I'll write the serial numbers of the pieces that were generated off that pattern so that everything is kind of cross-referenced so that, you know, if someone wants to do, uh, you know, a book on me or do some research on me now or later, there's going to be some information. Or use those garments for education and inspiration. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Susan, you said that your your customers, you don't necessarily document for your customers, or you didn't when you were doing a lot of... No, it was, you know, it's contemporary stuff. It's, it's yeah. one of a kind. And there always was, certainly these were wedding gowns, so there were always beautiful photographs of them. But um, no, I... It was different than what Kenneth did, I think, because <clears throat> it, it wasn't for me. It came and it went. You know, my job was to make them a beautiful dress, which is which is kind of what I did, and off it goes. So I don't know. I certainly certain ones stand out as, as having been particularly beautiful, but um, no, no, I never had any kind of a organized archive at all. No. Well, thirty years from now, when someone is going to remake one of your dresses to fit someone else. <laughs> They'll wish they had that. <laughs> yes. So now I want to, I, I, I'm just curious, Susan, because I've done this. Are there things inside the dress that they don't know about? I don't know if there's anything they don't know about, but I also, I always put a lot of things inside the dress. I had a wonderful gal in, because you know, wedding dress, it, it's such a wonderful canvas, literally for all kinds of emotional things. And there was a wonderful gal in San Francisco who I would have hand embroider beautiful work, the, um, a monogram on the lining. And I would send her the piece of lining with the seam lines kind of based it on it. And this wasn't just a small monogram. This was sort of a big piece. So the bride would pick her favorite flower, her favorite colors. And of course the monogram has to be your name before you get married. <clears throat> so it could be her initials and the date written out, whatever. We'd spend a lot of time doing that. And then, um, I would always tie a little blue bow and hanging off it would be a gold, a real gold, a gold horseshoe or a gold heart that I thought could later go on a charm bracelet or, you know, baby's necklace or something. So there was that. Um, every now and then some would have, would have a special token. Somebody had a dog and she had a charm of the dog and the dog was incorporated in the dress. Um, but nothing, no, I, I didn't have any secret, um, secret stuff hidden away. No. Kenneth, um, did you? Yes, actually. Well, Kenneth first off, that. <laughs> well, I <clears throat> a particular Tibetan chant, Om Mani Padme Hum, mm -hmm. is on the inside of pretty much everything. But then there was the, in, I know. Sorry, in what form? Would you uh, just, write it, it or would either, embroider it? Yeah, or? Embroider it on the mm -hmm. inner lining or whatever. Mm -hmm. they, they never knew. Right. The other thing I would do, well, this is this is kind of a one-off. I had, I did, made this big velvet cape for this customer. We're talking 16 yards of velvet. It was cross-dyed velvet. It was sapphire blue ground, black nap. It was, it weighed a ton. <laughs> and she, it had the big hood. And she said, think French lieutenant's woman. You know, as she wanted to sweep into a room, I said, you will. It'll be like wearing a theater curtain. But by God, you will sweep into the room. She and so, watch the furniture. She'll knock the room. Well, over. it was, you know, and, it, and, and so, so it was, you know, velvet, interline velvet. And I like to interline velvet with cotton flannelette. I just mm -hmm. think it looks better. Sew it with a 3.5 length stitch, 0 0.5 width, so that you don't get the puckers. But I found <laughs> that children's pajama flannel was much less expensive than cotton flannelette interlining. It was the same thing. It just had a print on it. And so, <laughs> and how I really remember this is some years later, she brought it back for some repairs and I went into it. It was like, because there were teddy bears and toy trucks in there. <laughs> And, and I'd forgotten about it. And I opened up the line. I'm like, oh, yeah, I had good times. Yeah. Uh, well, from the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think that's about our time, Susan and Kenneth. And I want to thank you so much for spending the afternoon talking with us. 
my it pleasure. It's great to hear all Absolute about your, your experiences <laughs> and your opinions. And uh, we hope to have you back again in another few months. Well, that would we be would, great. Or we sooner. Would that. <laughs> sooner. Love Let's that. do it. Yes, okay. I'm up for it. Okay. Hope you enjoyed it. Great. Yes. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for listening. Follow Threads on social media and visit threadsmagazine.com to view show notes for this episode. While you're on the site, check out Threads Insider, our online membership with exclusive access to expert sewing techniques. Until next time, keep on sewing with Threads.